بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمدللہ الحمدللہ رب العالمین والصلاة والسلام وعلى سید الشف الانبیاء والمرسلین سیدنا محمد وعلى آلہ وآصحابہ اجمعین اما بعد فاؤذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم Now today's lecture will be a first part in a four-part series based on the Aqeedah and the beliefs of a Muslim based on the Aqeedah and the beliefs of, a Mus of Islam and of a person who believes in the Sharia and in the religion of Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam now the word Aqidah is derived from the Arabic word Aqada which means to confirm or to consolidate and that's why in the Holy Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when describing a particular type of oath known as Yamina Mun Aqidah uses the words Bima aqattumul ayman i.e. that oath which you made with certainty that oath which you made with full conviction from the heart and yermina mun aqida is a type of oath where a person he makes without any mistakes without any misgivings that he is going to do this he is going to do that and if he fails to fulfill this particular oath or this particular qasam then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains for kafaratuhu that its expiation is that a person would have to free a slave and if he is unable to free a slave then he will have to feed ten miskeens, ten destitute and if he is unable to do that فَمَلَّمْ yajid for siyamu thalasati ayyam he will have to fast for three days and according to Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah, these three days have to be kept consecutively. So in a nutshell, literally Aqeedah means to confirm or to consolidate. Technically, Aqeedah means without any doubt, without any misgivings, to believe Amantu Billah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ To believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's angels وَكُتُبِهِ To believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's books وَرُسُلِهِ To believe in His prophets and messengers وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ To believe in the final day To believe in day of judgment To believe that there will be a day when we will be questioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our deeds in this world the good and the bad وَالْقَدْرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ مِنَ اللَّهِ And to believe that fate or taqdeeb, the good and the bad is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And lastly, وَالْبَعْثِ بَعْدَ الْمَوْتِ And to believe in resurrection, to believe in life after death. So Aqeedah in a nutshell compromises or consists of seven things. From belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the way up to resurrection and life after death now today's talk will be focused on the first part of this Aqeedah the first part of having belief in certain things about Allah about messengers about the books and today's talk or lecture will be based on Tawheed and the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now Tawheed is derived from the Arabic verb, the Arabic root word Wahada, which means to unify or to make something one. And technically the word Tawheed means to believe in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To believe that there is only one God, to believe that the only being the only person who is worthy of worship is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without any sharik, without any partners in his zat, i.e. in his being, i.e. in other words not to believe 
that there are other gods besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also Tawheed technically means to believe that there is no partners in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attributes so basically Tawheed means to believe that there is one God to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have any partners to believe that there are no other gods or goddesses besides Allah and also to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unique in his attributes and there is no one other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has these attributes which only belongs and exclusively belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so in a nutshell that is Tawheed now Tawheed is the core and is the essence of Islam and it is the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us and it is also the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets and messengers to this world when Sayyiduna Adam alayhi salam was sent to this world there was no need for Tawheed there was no issues regarding Shirk because everybody believed in Sayyiduna Adam alayhi salam everybody believed in the oneness of Allah now when Sayyiduna Adam alayhi salam left this world he had approximately 3,000 children and one of his children Sayyiduna Shis alayhi salam was then made the next prophet and after Sayyiduna Shis alayhi salam passed away and generations and generations passed ignorance and jahalat started to excel and started to increase in the people and what happened was that there was a man in the form of shaitan he approached some of the leaders of the tribe and he said to them that look at your forefathers they were very pious people you know your forefathers like Sayyiduna Adam alayhi salam, Shis alayhi salam they were prophets and messengers they were very very pious people why don't you make some pictures or some images or some kind of idols of them and he said to them that you don't have to worship them you could worship Allah but just have these idols there as a reminder of take inspiration from them that these were great people great forefathers you had just take inspiration from them just have them there as a reminder so the people they listened to shaitan and what happened was that they believed in Allah but had these idols and these images at home or around their city or around their country to remind them of their past now what happened was that when these people passed away and the next generation came and then they forgot about why the first generation people made these idols they then thought to themselves that actually who's Allah who is this person these are our idols these images these idols are actually our gods so they then started worshipping these idols and these images and that's when shirk and ascribing partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started and that's when the first prophet who was sent thereafter i sayyiduna nu alayhi salam all the way up to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's time there was always one unifying message take an example of surah yahud which is in the uh, 12th para so in this particular chapter 12th para surah yahud and regarding this particular surah one of the distinct features of this surah is that it talks about prophets being sent to their people and also the mass punishment which hit these people when they disobeyed their prophets when they disobeyed their messengers so he talks about the people of Lut, the way they were destroyed the people of Madian, the way they were destroyed the people of Ad, the way they were destroyed and when you look through this particular surah there's one common feature you will find when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about the respective prophets and that is that the prophets they would go to their qawm to their nation and they would say to them Allah, ma lakum min ilahin that worship Allah and besides Allah there is no other God there is no one else except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so what we can gather is since from Sayyiduna Nu alayhi salam's time all the way up to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam's time every messenger or prophet sent all sent with one message and that was Tawheed the oneness of Allah to believe in Allah 
to worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not anyone else. Now this topic of Tawheed is a very vast and a very great topic, very broad as well. And to make it easier, what we're going to do is that we're going to touch on this uh, topic in three different angles. So we're going to be looking at three different categories which are connected with the topic of Tawheed. The first category or the first topic which we are going to look at is regarding Tawheed al rububiyyah which means to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our creator, He is our Lord. Number two is Tawheed Uluhiya, which means to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only worthy of worship. And then number three, lastly, we will look at some divine attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His qualities and so on and so forth. Now let's begin with the first topic, Tawheed Rububiya. Now Tawheed Rububiya means to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is one but also at the same time to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of this world that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the heavens he created the earth he created the mountains the hills he created human beings he created jinnats he created animals that everything which happens in this world happens because of Allah's will because of Allah's intention or Allah's irada or whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees or whatever is meant to happen it's happened because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had decreed or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had willed it to happen and also Tawheed al rububiya means that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable of giving life and death allazi yuhyi wa yumit that only Allah gives life where you meet and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives death and moat. Not like Namrud, the tyrant king of Ibrahim alayhi salam's time, who called two prisoners and he let one go and he killed the other. And he starts saying to Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ana uhi wa umit, that I give life and I give death as well. Not like that. But life means from a speck of sperm, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives it existence, gives it life, makes it into a human being. And what you meet means that whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides, whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, then he decides death and he gives mode to that particular person. Namrud doesn't decide when death is given. And also Abu Jahal and Umayyah bil Khalf don't decide when death is given. The reason I mention Abu Jahl and Umayyah, Umayyah bin Khalfiyah is that it's mentioned a hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, a very famous hadith that Umayyah bin Khalf, he was friends with Hazrat Saad bin Mu'az anhu. and this friendship started before Saad bin Mu'az anhu converted to Islam. So basically from the days of ignorance that's when this friendship started between Umayyah bin Khalf and Saad bin Mu'az al -Anhu. And it's mentioned in the hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari that whenever Umayyah bin Khalf would go to Syria for business, for trading, and he would pass by Medina Munawwara, he would stop over at Saad bin Mu'az al -Anhu's house for a few days and then he would go to Syria or on the way back from Syria he would stop over at his house and then continue with the journey to Mecca. And similarly, Saad bin Mu'az anhu, whenever he would go to Yemen for trading, for business, he would stop over at Umayyah bin Khalf's house for a few days and then go to Yemen. Or vice versa, when he's returning back from Yemen, he would stop over at his house and then continue with the journey to Medina Munawwara. Now once Saad bin Mu'az anhu was in Mecca, he was in Umayyah bin Khalf's house. And in his house he said to Umayyah bin Khalf that, Oh Umayyah, can you give me amnesty or can you give me security that I would be able to go to the Baytullah and perform Umrah? Remember the pagans of Mecca, the Mushrikeens of Arabia, they would do 
uh, Hajj, they would go for Umrah because the actual the pilgrimage, the Umrah, the Hajj was something which was started from Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam's time and the generations thereafter, even though they were involved in shirk and idol worshipping, they would still go to the Baytullah and perform Umrah and Hajj. So Sa'd bin Mu'az is saying to Umayyah bin Khalf that, give me amnesty so that I can go to the Baytullah and perform Umrah. So Umayyah bin Khalf agreed. So Sa'd bin Mu'az, they went to the Baytullah, he was performing his Umrah and Abu Jahal who was the leader of the Quraysh he saw them and he approaches Sa'd bin Mu'az and he says to Sa'd bin Mu'az that if it wasn't for Umayyah I would have chopped your head off by now but why? because obviously Sa'd bin Mu'az had converged to Islam so obviously there's that hatred there, there's that enmity there so he's saying to Sa'd bin Mu'az that look if it wasn't for Umayyah bin Khalf I would have killed you by now now Sa'ad bin Mu'az who then got angry and he replied back to Abu Jahl and he said that if you don't retract your words, if you don't take back what you just said to me, I will stop you from going to Syria. Because what would happen is that whenever the Quraysh would go to Syria, they would have to pass by Medina Munawwara. So he said that if you don't take your words back, I'll stop you from going to Syria. Now Umayyah bin, ja uh, Umayyah bin Khalfi was there, so he was saying to Sa'd bin Mu'az, oh, Sa'd bin Mu'az, just calm down a bit. You know, Abu Jahl, he's our leader, he's Abu Al-Hakam. You know, you shouldn't be speaking like that in a very harsh way, in a harsh tone to Abu Jahl, Abu Al-Hakam, our leader. So then Sa'd bin Mu'az al Anhu then turns around to Umayyah bin Khalf and he says to him that my Prophet, I, my Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, has predicted that you are going to get killed that soon you are going to die. Now the story then moves along that when the time of Badr came, the battle of Badr in 2nd Hijri, Abu Jahl said to Umayyah bin Khalf that Umayyah you need to come for this battle because this is a battle where we need to beat the Muslims up so you need to be there, you're one of the leaders. Now Umayyah bin Khalf he remembered what Sa'd bin Mu'az who told him that soon he was going to die so he said to Abu Jahl, you know what? Uh, I don't really feel comfortable, I don't want to go for this battle and so on. Then Abu Jahl said to Umayyah bin Khalf, you don't have to worry, I'll give you the fastest horse which I have, I'll give you that, so you could ride this horse and whenever you apprehend or you fear that you're going to get attacked or you're going to get killed, you could use this horse and you could basically do one from the battlefield and go all the way back to Mecca and uh, we won't consider you to be a coward for leaving the battle or anything like that. So Umayyah bin Khalf then forgot about what Sa'd bin Mu'az who told him and said, okay, I'll, get, I'll come with the battlefield. So he then took the horse, he went to the battlefield, but because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had decreed that he was going to get killed, he didn't have the opportunity to return back, but instead during the battle of Badr, that's when he got killed. So what I'm trying to say is that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides where you die, when you die. Just when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said that he was going to die, so Umayyah bin Khal should have taken that advice and shouldn't have basically gone for the battle of Badr. But because he thought that, oh, I'll use the horse to get away from death, it doesn't work like that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whenever he decides that you're going to die somewhere or in a particular place, you have to go there. Allah will make means for you to go there and the death will come to you in that particular place like it happened with Umayyah bin Khalf. So in a nutshell, Tawheed al rububiyyah basically means that to believe in Allah, that Allah is one, to believe Allah is the creator of the world, to believe that everything which runs in this world is because of Allah's will and that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives life and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives death. Now just on this topic of Tawheed al rububiyyah this belief is not something unique with Muslims. It's not something only Muslims believe. Just on this Tawheed al rububiyyah that Allah is one, Allah has created everything. It's not just Muslims who believe in this. But we'll find that the Jews, they also have the same belief as well. That they believe that Allah is one, they believe that Allah created the world. Similarly, Unitarian Christians, they also have the same beliefs as well. That Allah is one, Allah created this world, they have the same belief. Even to the extent 
that the pagans of Mecca, not all of them, but most of them and some of them, also believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. When you look at the Quran, Allah says to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam that if you were to ask them, are you the pagans of Mecca, that who created this world, who created the heavens, who gives you risk, who gives you sustenance, فَسَيَقُولُونَ Allah. They would all say that Allah, that Allah created the world, Allah gives us sustenance, Allah created the heavens, Allah created the earth. They'll say that. But the reason why the pagans of Makkah are not considered to be Muslims is as we're going to look at later, they did not believe that Allah is worthy of worship. They believed Allah is one, but also at the same time they would worship idols and they would say that, no, we worship idols as well because they will help us in the hereafter. So that's why that takes them out of the fold of Islam. But on the concept of Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, the pagans of Makkah, they believed in that concept. The Jews, they believe in this concept as well. And similarly, the Unitarian Christians, they also believe in this concept as well. And those religions who do not believe in this, say for example, the Trinitarian Christians, such as uh, who say that the Father, Son and Holy Spirit that makes up their gods and so on, they believe in three gods. And similarly, various pagan religions which are around like Hinduism, Sikhism and so on, who say that uh, there is a God for rain, a God for sustenance, God for this and God for that. They don't believe in this concept of Tawheed al -Rububiyya. But as you can see, the other religions like Judaism, like Unitarian Christians, they believe in the concept of Tawheed al -Rububiyya, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this earth, He created this world and only Allah gives life and death. So that in a nutshell is the first category or the first topic of Tawheed, Tawheed al -Rububiyya. The second category of Tawheed is called Tawheed al which means to believe that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worthy of worship. And this is where a lot of people fall short on. This is where other religions fall short on and as I'm going to explain, this is where sometimes, may Allah forbid, some Muslims fall short on as well. That sometimes we pray to Allah, but at the same time our intention may be for someone else. So what does Tawheed al-Uluhiya mean? It means to believe that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worthy of worship and to pray and to worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we are worshipping Allah, our intention should only be for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not for anyone else. Now this term, like for example, praying for Allah or worshipping only for Allah, in Arabic we call this ikhlas, sincerity, i.e. to worship only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why the very first hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, the very first hadith of Mishkat al-Masabih, the very first hadith of Imam Nawawi Rahimullah's Riyaz al-Saliheen is a hadith narrated by Umar bin Khattab anhu where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has said إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ niyat. The actions are according to intentions. And the reason why the respected uh, muhaddithin have mentioned this hadith right at the beginning is so that the students when they are learning this hadith or when they are learning this book or the audience when they are listening to this particular hadith or when the teacher is teaching this particular hadith or when the lecturer is explaining this particular hadith it should be a reminder for everyone that the hadith which we are studying the hadith which we are learning or the conference or the talk or the lecture which we are attending should be done with the intention to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the intention here is for something other than Allah, then even though you've got the information, but you won't be able to act upon it. 
That's why we see that there's so many lectures and talks and conferences going along and many, many people attending. And they listen to the talks, they listen to the lectures, but it, like, it goes through one ear and it comes out from the other. Now, one of the reasons is that sometimes when we attend these lectures, our intention isn't correct. Our intention is something else. If our intention is to please Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then you'll see that there'll be barakah in the lecture which you attended. You'll see that whatever you've learned, you then put it into practice and then you can make a positive change in the society. Sometimes what happens, we attend lectures and our intention is the refreshments which are given at the end. You know, the biryani which is given at the end or the iftar which is going to be given at the end. Now, if your intention is that, then fair enough, you listen to the talk, it'll go from one ear, it'll come out from the other, but you're not going to be understanding anything. So our main intention when we go to talks or lectures, when we listen to any dars and so on, should be for the pleasure and for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for His happiness, if our intention is corrupted, if it's for something else, if it's for worldly reason, if it's for fame, if it's for fame that you say to brothers that, oh, I attend such and such sheikh's lectures, Bukhari lectures, Mishkat lectures, or Riyaz al Salihin lectures, or if the teacher or the lecturer, his intention is fame as well, then there'll be no benefit there. So what I'm trying to say is that whenever we do any ibadat or any worship, whether we are attending lectures or talks and so on, it should be there with the intention to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the opposite of ikhlas and sincerity is what we call in Arabic riyah. And riyah means to do something for someone other than Allah. I.e. you're praying namaz, you're giving sadqah or charity, but you're not doing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you're doing it for somebody else. That is known as riyah. And as mentioned in the hadith, riyah is known as shirk khafi. It's known as the discreet shirk. It's that shirk which is inside your heart. You don't realize it, but it's there. It's mentioned in a hadith which can be found in Musnad Ahmad, narrated by Sayyid, Sayyiduna Abu Sa'id al Khudri al Anhu, that once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi sallam he addressed the companions, the Sahabas, and he said to them that shall I not tell you of a disease or of a fitna, I fear more more than the fitna of Masihud Dajjal. So the Sahabas asked that, O oh, Prophet of Allah, what could that be? So Rasulullah replied by saying that a person, the fitna which I fear is a person, he's in ibadat, he's in salah, he's in prayers, and then he increases or improves the level of his ibadat or of his worship why? Because someone is watching him. Because someone is looking at him. That he may be leading the prayer, he's reciting, but then he knows that such and such a person is watching me. So what does he do? He then puts an extra 10% effort in the recitation. Or like he's in namaz, he's in worship, somebody just entered the masjid and he knows that oh, such and such a person is watching me. So what does he do? He puts a bit more extra concentration, you know, just like puts his head down a bit more to show that he's concentrating in his namaz. So that is known as riyah. And that's, as mentioned in the hadith, is known as shirk, a discreet shirk. And everybody knows the punishment of shirk. Inna Allah la yaghfiru ay yushraka bi. That Allah will never ever forgive shirk. So this is where, if we're going to have these kind of uh, beliefs or if that is our intention that we're doing it for someone else, then what we can understand is that we're not actually doing tawheed uluhiyat. That we believe in Allah, but then when we are doing our worship, we're not doing it solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're doing it for someone else. And that's why it's mentioned in another hadith of Sahih Muslim, that in the hereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to that person, that don't come to me for the reward, don't come to me for the sawab, go to such and such a person, go to Abdurrahman or Abdullah, whoever you prayed your namaz for, whoever you did your ibadat for, go to him and get your reward and sawab from him. So this is the, the danger of Riyah, this is the importance at the same time of Ikhlas, that whenever we do any type of ibadat, any type of worship, 
it should be done with the intention to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which then takes me on to another point here is regarding sacrificing now again this is where a lot of people fall short in that sometimes what happens is that you'll get some people they're sacrificing a goat or a sheep or a cow or a camel or whatever it may be when they're sacrificing they're saying bismillah allah akbar they're saying the the name of allah and then they sacrifice the animal but their intention is to please their sheikh or please their saint or their peer or someone again if it is done with that intention that animal would be considered to be a mater a carcass something haram something unlawful to consume because again in the quran allah says that when you are slaughtering or sacrificing it should be done again with the sole pleasure of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even though you're saying it verbally bismillah allah wakbar and you're sacrificing the animal and even though you may have the hmc inspectors there they're watching you observing you so they may give you the hmc kind of certificate but because your intention was not for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it was for your saint or your sheikh or your peer and so on then that animal would become a mata that animal would be unlawful and haram to consume so what we can gather from here is that any ibadat sacrificing whatever it may be it has to be done with the intention to please allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it should be done with the pleasure of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's a couple of points which i need to mention here now what, what we can understand from tawheed uluhiyat is that you should pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala similarly when it comes to dua supplicating you should only supplicate to allah asking anyone else besides allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your needs and for your desires that will also amount to shirk as well and this in arabic we call it istigatha where you're calling out to someone besides allah so just say for example there's a a sheikh or someone who's passed away so you go to his grave and you call out to this sheikh or to this peer and you say that oh peer or sheikh do this for me then that would be shirk that is like you're calling or you're asking for help to someone other than allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will that also goes against this principle of tawhid uluhiyat now this then takes me on to a ruling which i want to clarify is that is it permissible to say ya muhammad same way people they'll go to their saint graves and say ya this or ya that how about say for example saying ya muhammad is that permissible or is that allowed now the belief of the ahl sunnah wal jama'a is that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is alive in his grave that's our aqidah our belief that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is alive in his grave and also his body has retained the same freshness as it was 1400 years ago so if say for example if you did dig up the grave rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the body will be exactly the same that's our aqidah that's our belief so our belief is that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is alive in his grave similarly whenever we send any durood or any salams or salutations then as mentioned the hadith of abu dawood and tirmizi the salutations the durood are also conveyed to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam also answers the durood and the salams and the salutations which are being sent to him now some of these salutations and duruds as you probably know have the word ya muhammad some of them not all of them some of them have like you read a particular durood and then it's got ya muhammad now the question is that is it permissible for us to read these types of duruds and salutations bearing in mind it has the word ya muhammad there now the answer is that when we reading these duruds or salams or salutations our aqida or our belief should be from the word ya muhammad that not prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is in front of us but prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is alive in his grave so when we are sending the durood the durood is being sent to prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam via the angels but we should not have the aqida or the belief 
that Prophet is in front of us or he's everywhere because as we're going to look at later that is an attribute only unique and specific with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when you are saying Ya Muhammad in a particular durood or in a salam or a salutation then the belief and the aqidah should be that Prophet is alive in his grave but he's not in front of us when we are saying this particular durood or this particular salat or this particular salam. Now there's another point here where sometimes people get mixed up with and they think that they're the same. So I mentioned istighasa, like calling to someone other than Allah, that's haram, that's shirk. But there's another word which in Arabic is called tawassul. Now the question is that is tawassul, is that permissible or not? Now what does tawassul mean? Tawassul basically means that you're calling to Allah. You're praying to Allah. You're making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you're using an intermediary form. You're using a kind of like an intercession or an intermediary form in the middle. So it could be something like you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something but through the barakah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam or through a barakah of a certain good deed which you have done so that is tawassul now without going into too detail there are two main categories of tawassul the first one is where you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something through the barakah and through the <coughs> blessings of a good deed which you have done now an example can be found in a hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari Sahih Muslim a very famous hadith <coughs> that there were three people from the Banu Israel who were once stuck in a cave they, were, they went inside the cave and then a big massive rock fell and it blocked the entrance of the cave so the three of them were inside the cave so one of them suggested that let's pray to Allah, let's do dua to Allah and when we are doing dua to Allah we'll mention a particular good deed which we have done and then we'll pray to Allah and then hopefully Allah will accept our duas and the uh, rock would move from the cave. So the first person he made dua to Allah and he reminded Allah that Allah I respected my parents and through the barakah of this good deed I respecting parents I pray to you that can you save us from here can you uh, open the or can you move the rock from the cave so Allah accepted the dua and the rock slightly moved away from the cave then the second person he raised his hands and then he prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he remembered a particular good deed he did which was that he saved himself from zina that there was an opportunity where he could have done zina with one of his cousin sisters but he refrained from the opportunity so he then said to Allah Allah I did this good deed I refrain you from zina and I pray to you that using the barakah of this good deed that can you move the rock from the cave again Allah accepted the dua and the uh, rock slightly moved away from the cave and then the third person he reminded Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that once there was a person who did a job for him but then that person went away without taking the wages, without taking the money. So what did this person do? Uh, he then used the money, the wages of that person, and he bought a field, he bought some tractors, he bought like all these other equipment, and he started like harvesting on the field. Then after many, many years, that person who he didn't pay, returns back and he says to him that, look, I want my money, I want my wages. So then that person, what he did was that, he said that, you know, all this field, which I harvested, all the things which I bought, all this field is for you. I give it to you everything. That's the basically the what we call in Urdu the natija, you know, the end product of the wages which you left with me. So then that person he did dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by using this uh, good deed which he did, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed the rock from the cave. So what we can understand is that to do tawassul using a good deed then that is something which is allowed. And you probably hear the Imam Sahib when they're like doing du'as and so on, they say that, oh Allah, you know, through the sadqa of such and such a person, or through the, you know, the young children which we have, or through this particular good deed, you know, can you forgive us all and so on. So to make these kind of du'as, then that is something which is allowed and permissible. The second 
part of tawassul is where people they're making dua but they're using individuals like say prophet sallallahu wasallam or a companion or a particular sheikh or a particular peer so that the question is that is that permissible or not now again without going into too detail the scholars have said that to use the tawassul of say rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam or of the sahabas or of the tabi'in the predecessors and their predecessors the tabi tabi'in to use their tawassul to make dua to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then that is permissible and that is allowed now why have the scholars restricted it to prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the sahabas the tabi'in and tabi tabi'in why have the scholars restricted it to them for now the reason why is because prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as our belief is he is masum which means that he is sinless uh, he cannot commit any sins nor did he have the urge to commit a sin regarding the sahabas as allah says radiyallahu anhum wa radu an that allah is pleased with them they are pleased with allah similarly the tabi'in the tabi tabi'in has mentioned the hadith خير القرون قرني ثم الذين يلونهم ثم الذين يلونهم that their era and their predecessors era is a blessed era in Islam so because their era is blessed because the sahabas the companions are unique so therefore to use their names but remember you're asking Allah by using the baraka of themselves or their names to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that would be allowed but besides them anybody else now even though that person mashallah could be very very pious and very religious but he's not the same bracket of a sahabi of a companion he's not in the same level as rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam even though he's maybe present and he may be alive within us and we know that he's really really pious that particular sheikh or that particular peer or that particular person but you can't say that that person is similar to a sahabi he won't reach the level of a sahabi he won't reach the level of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so therefore when you are going to do tawassul then it's best that you just keep it to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the companions the tabi'in and so on but don't go overboard and start using like any like imam's name or your local imam's name and do tawassul with him to ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then that would be wrong why because you know that imam even though he may be very very pious or religious you won't you know uh, you won't consider him to be in the same level as a sahabi as a companion or as rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so what we can understand here is that istighatha i.e. calling to someone other than allah that's not allowed that's impermissible however to uh, call to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by using the baraka or the blessing say of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam or of a good deed or of a good action and that is something which is permissible and allowed in islam So to conclude the nutshell of this particular second category of uh, tawhid tawhid al uluhiyah is basically to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only worthy of worship as i mentioned that whenever we sacrificing it should be done with the pleasure of Allah whenever we do any kind of ibadat or worship again it should be done with the intention to uh, please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's happiness even to the extent that placing trust as well trust should be placed on allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's also another part of tawhid al uluhiyah that you, whenever something happens you take the means but you don't just place your trust in the means but instead also at the same time you place your trust in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala i'll give you an example of sayyidina yaqub alayhi salam that when his brothers or oh sorry when his sons the 10 sons when they went to egypt the first time to get some food from the minister of egypt i.e. sayyiduna yusuf alayhi salam so yusuf alayhi salam said to them that okay i'm gonna, i'm going to give you the food now but next time i'm not going to give it to you unless you bring your brother binyamin so they went to yaqub alayhi salam they asked yaqub that can you give us binyamin Yaqub alayhi salam initially refused why because he remembered the story of Yusuf that when the brothers took Yusuf alayhi salam they took him and then they obviously uh, 
threw him into the uh, well and then they bought the shirt smeared with the fake blood with them in Kazib as mentioned in the Holy Quran. So Yaqub initially said to the brothers that no, I'm not going to give you Binyamin. But then eventually he agreed. And he said to the brothers that okay, when you now enter Egypt, then la tadkhulu min babin wahidin. That do not enter Egypt through one door or through one gate. Wadkhulu min abwabin mutafarrika, but enter Egypt through different doors and different gates. Now the reason why Yaqub gave this order is to protect his sons from the evil eye. Because Yaqub salam's children were very, very handsome, were very, very beautiful. Yusuf salam was very handsome and very beautiful, but the other sons he had, they were also very good looking, very handsome as well. So Yaqub salam feared that if they all went uh, through one door, one gate, then everybody would be looking at them, you know, would be looking at these sons, so beautiful, so handsome, they could give them the evil eye. So he said that, you know what, enter through, different doors, different gates, so that no one gives you the evil eye. And then after, he, so that's the means which Yaqub salam took. He told them, that's the means that enter through different doors and gates. And then lastly, he says, which means that upon Allah, those who have trust, place their trust. So what we can understand is that whenever we do anything in life, always take the means, but then again, Tawheed uluhiya dictates that we place our trust in only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Again, not in a particular sheikh, not in a particular individual or peer or anything like that But again, placing our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Now the, so that concludes the second category of Tawheed Now the third category of Tawheed Is basically talks about the divine names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, there are many, many attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though we know that there are 99 names of Allah, but other muhaddisins like Ibn Dihya in particular, he's of the view that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has thousands of attributes and thousands of divine names. Now, what do we mean by the attributes or the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Now, what I mentioned at the beginning, the first two categories, what we could understand from Tawheed, Rububiyya and Uluhiyya is that Allah is one. Now, when you look at it, if you want to try to convince, say, a non-Muslim or even an atheist to believe in Allah, and if you were to say to him that, oh, believe in Allah, he is one. That's not going to be enough to convince the atheist to believe in the oneness of Allah or to believe in Islam or to believe in Allah. You have to tell him some of the qualities or some of the attributes of Allah. So that's where all the other attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes in. So I'll give you an example. Like one of the attributes of Allah is that he is al Ali. Now al Ali means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knowing. So when we use this attribute or divine name of Allah, it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perfect in this attribute. Now what I mean by that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows everything. He knows, say for example, what's happening in this world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's happening in the room next door, what's happening in the house next door, what's happening say in another area, what's happening in another country or like for example what's happening in our homes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows basically Allah has knowledge of everything now human beings they also have knowledge as well we have knowledge but our knowledge is nothing compared to the knowledge of Allah because Allah's knowledge is all perfect our knowledge is always holes there's always like deficiencies there's always things where we don't know even a great scholar or a great alim he won't say that I know everything so that's how Allah has made it. وَفَوْكَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ As mentioned in the Quran, that on top of uh, every knowledgeable person, Alim, they will always be going to be a knowledgeable person. Always uh, keep that in mind, even a scholar or an imam, whoever, that don't think that you just know everything. There will always be someone who knows more than you. So similarly, when it comes to this attribute of Allah that He is all-knowing, 
that even with the case of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, when somebody asked him the question that, you know, who's the most knowledgeable, then Musa alayhi salam said, I'm the most knowledgeable. So again, Allah didn't write the answer. So what happened was that he then sent Hazrat Khidr alayhi salam, and then the whole issue, Hazrat Khidr alayhi salam, you know, having more knowledge than Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam. So this is like all walks of life that there will always be someone who is more knowledgeable than you. And even if there is someone in this world who has so much knowledge, then always keep in mind, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more knowledgeable than him. So when we look at all the attributes of Allah, you know, Allah is Al-Qadi, He is the All-Powerful and so on. Al-Quddus, As-Salam, you know, so many attributes of Allah. It means that all these attributes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unique in these attributes. Now this then takes me on to a particular point or a ruling which I want to mention <coughs> is that we mentioned these names of Allah that Allah is Alim, He is Al-Ahad, He is the one, as Samad, He is not in need of anyone. Now the question is that is it permissible to keep these names? Like can you call someone Al-Ahad? Or can you call someone Al-Alim? Or can you call someone uh, as samad just the word as samad or Al-Ahad, is it permissible to give that as a name to a child or to someone? Now the ruling is that because these names, Al-Ahad, as samad even the word Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim with the Alif Lam at the beginning, these are all unique names of Allah. Because as I said, only Allah can be the most merciful. We can be merciful, but our mercy compared to Allah is nothing. So only Allah can be Ar-Rahman. Only Allah can be Ar-Rahim. Only Allah can be Al-Ali. Only Allah is Al-Ahad, the one. Only Allah is a summon not in need of anyone. So because these names or these attributes are unique with Allah, it is not permissible to call a child by these names. Just to call a child Al-Ahad or as Samad or Al-Quddus, then that would not be permissible. However, the only time you can use these names as to call someone or to name a child is if you use the word Abd, which means slave, before these words. So to call someone Abdul Ahad or Abdullah or Abdul Rahman or Abdul Salam or Abdul Quddus or Abdul Samad, then that would be permissible. But to call someone just like the name by itself, like Al-Ahad, al Samad, then that would not be allowed, that would not be permissible. Then there are other names of Allah, which is actually what we call a shared characteristic. That Allah possesses it, but it can also be possessed by human beings as well. Like the word Ali, Ain Lam Ya. Now if it's Al-Ali, that's different, that's only unique with Allah. But if it's without the Alif Lam and if you say Ali, then that means the high. So obviously Allah is the high, but also a human being can also be high as well in terms of either virtues, in terms of fazilat, in terms of like say knowledge, a human being can be high as well. So in that case, because the word Ali is a shared characteristic, it can be possessed by Allah and also possessed by human beings as well. So therefore for a child to be called Ali, then that would be permissible. And we see that through Sayyidina Ali that uh, his full name Ali bin Abi Talib that is a permissible name. Another example could be the word Hakim. Again, if it's Al-Hakim, then you can't keep it. But if it's just the word Hakim, then because that's a shared characteristic, Hakim means the wife. So because Allah is the most wise, but also human beings can also be wise as well. So therefore to call a child Hakim, that would be allowed. And we see of a Sahabi or a companion in the name of Hakim bin Hizam anhu. So that was a name which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam kept and obviously he didn't prohibit such a name. So what we can understand is that names or divine names which are unique with Allah, it's only for Allah and it can't be kept with uh, for anyone else. Whereas names which are shared characteristics that, that can be kept, uh, that can be sorry, kept for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it can also be kept for uh, others as well. Now moving along with these uh, attributes of Allah. So as I mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has many, many attributes. And the attributes which are mentioned, like Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, it's got to do more 
in terms of Allah's uh, compassion. It's got to do more with Allah's knowledge and so on. Now, at the same time, when we look through the Holy Quran and look through the Hadith, we find some attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which seems from the outset that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has features which are similar to human beings. Say for example in the Holy Quran it's mentioned Fatamma Wajullah. It says Allah's got a face. Biyadillah yu'tihi may yasha that it says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got a hand. In a hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, it's mentioned that in the hereafter when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fill hell up, hell will then say to Allah that is there any more? So the hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim then goes on to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would then put his foot inside hell and he would kind of press it and then hell would then say qat qat which means you know sufficient, that's enough, that's enough. Uh, there's more space now. So these two verses and the hadith I mentioned from Sahih al-Bukhari where he talks about Allah's foot. There's uh, hadith, there's Quranic verses bi'ayunina, Allah's eyes when he commanded Sayyiduna Nuh alayhi salam to build the ark, to build the boat, bi'ayunina in front of him, in front of his eyes. So there are many ayats like this where it says Allah's got eyes, Allah's got face, Allah's got hands. Like the hadith of Sayyid al-Bukhari, Allah's got foot. There's also a Quranic verse where he talks about Allah's got shins and so on. What do we mean by all these things? Because in another place in the Holy Quran, it says later commitly shay that there is nothing like Allah. Allah uh, meaning like Allah is not like any one of you. Allah doesn't have any faces. Allah doesn't have hands or arms. So what does he mean by these Quranic verses when he says Allah's got all these things? Now regarding these uh, Quranic verses and these hadiths there are two opinions given by the scholars of the past the first group of ulamas of the opinion that these type of verses we should believe in these verses that biadillah uh, we should believe in these verses but what he actually means we don't know so we believe in the verse, obviously you need to believe in a verse, the Quran to be considered as a Muslim and a believer. So we believe in all these verses. But what he actually means by Allah's hand or Allah's foot or Allah's shin and so on, Wallahu A'lam, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Like the Alif Lam Meem, Alif Lam Ra, you know, what do they mean? Only Allah knows best. So similarly when he says Allah's shins, Allah's hands, Allah's face, Allah's foot, then what we say is that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. We don't do any kind of interpretation. However, the second group of scholars, they say that these ayats, they believe in it, but also at the same time, they interpret these verses as well. So whatever it says, biyadillah, Allah's hand, obviously in Allah, they don't give it the physical meaning that Allah has a physical hand like the way you and I have. But when it says biyadillah, they say that biyadillah is the meaning of Allah's power. Or they give a meaning which is befitting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's shan or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's majesty or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's honor. So any meaning which is befitting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they give that when it comes to these types of uh, verses and so on. Now before we wrap this particular section up, this t a question which uh, a brother asked us recently and this is like a common question which uh, uh, sometimes people ask nowadays when it comes to Akida, when it comes to beliefs is regarding there are two schools of thought when it comes to beliefs one is known as Ash'aris and the other ones are known as Maturidis now again I don't want to go into too detail but again, it's like sometimes people ask these things that who are Ash'aris, who are Maturidis and so on, which one do you believe in? Now, regarding Ash'aris and Maturidis, think of them to be like scholars who are experts when it came to Aqidahs and beliefs. The same way we have Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmed, they were experts when it came to the field of fiqh, the subject of fiqh and so on when he came to deriving rules from the Quran and Hadith. Think of Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari 
and Imam Abu Mansur Maturidi to be experts when it came to beliefs and when it came to Aqidahs. And in particular with regards to Imam Abu Hassan al-Ashari, uh, he was from Yemen. And there's a beautiful story about uh, him and his family and his generation that after the conquest of Mecca, uh, many, many tribes, or we call them delegations, wufud, they came to Prophet Sallallahu and they accepted Iman, they accepted belief. So a tribe from Yemen, the Ash'ariyin, they came to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they believed in Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they started asking questions about Allah and the creation. You know, so they started asking Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or Prophet of Allah, what did Allah create first? So then Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam replied by saying, oh, firstly Allah created water, then after the water he created the throne, the arsh, then afterwards he created the heavens and the earth. So because of that question, that zeal they had, we're talking about the people who converted to Islam during Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's time. Thereafter, in each generation, the people of Ash'ariyin, i.e. the people of Yemen, i.e. Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari and his followers, they had this zeal of learning about Aqidah, learning about beliefs and so on. And that's why Imam Abu Hassan al-Ashari thereafter, he then became an expert in this particular field. It's like, you know, certain topics or subjects like fiqh or hadith, and then you have this zeal to learn. But this is something which Allah bestowed on his family to have the zeal when it came to Aqidah and beliefs. So from that time onwards, generations which followed thereafter, they always had this kind of like appetite, this kind of like zeal and uh, what we call shock to learn about, not just knowledge, but to learn about Aqidah, to learn about Allah, to learn about Risalat, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to learn about how this world came into existence. They always had that appetite and that kind of zeal to do that. And that's why Imam Abu Hassan al-Shari had this kind of, he was an expert in this field. Now going back to the question which sometimes brothers ask is that, what do we follow and so on? You know, there's no need to make a big issue and make it like in the different sects that oh, we follow Ash'aris and we follow Maturidis and make a big issue about that. Uh, as I said that they just like were scholars who were expert in the field of Aqidah. And when it came to Aqidahs, they more or less kind of uh, agreed with each other. It's only certain issues they kind of disagreed. But that's, you know, that's uh, irrelevant because even Imam Wanifa, Imam Shafi, they kind of disagreed in certain issues. You know, forget uh, the Aimai Arba, the Sahabas, the companions, they also disagreed in certain issues as well. So it just, uh, they just differed in certain issues. Generally speaking, those who are Hanafis, they tend to follow the Maturidi uh, school of Aqidah and beliefs. Whereas the Shafis, they tend to follow Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, Rahimullah's uh, school of uh, beliefs when it comes to Aqidahs and so on. So that's like the issue here. And with regards to the issue about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hand and so on, uh, they both, i.e. the Maturidis and Ash'aris, they are from the first group of scholars, i.e. they say that whenever these verses come, we should believe in it, but we should not interpret it, we should not say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has physical hands or anything like that, we should not do any kind of interpretation whatsoever. So to conclude at the end, uh, as I was mentioning that there are three types or three categories of Tawheed, the first is called Tawheed Rububiya, which means to believe in the oneness of Allah, to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. Thereafter went on to mention Tawheed Uluhiya, that to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only worthy of worship. When we're worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should only worship Allah and no one else besides Him. And lastly, the last point with regards to the divine attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah give us the tawfiq to act on what has been said. And finally, also like to thank the brothers who organized this event for giving me the tawfiq to convey the message of Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah accept the efforts. Wa akhiru that one. Alhamdulillah.